we're, we're, we're about to get ready. Um, just out of curiosity, um, how many people here have tried collecting data by getting independent acquisition or swap? Okay, well, how many people would like to? <laughs> that would be great. Um, this is kind of a, uh, a kind of growing area. The, uh, the, the, the field itself has been around, I would say, by 13 or 14 years. Uh, it's been around for a long time, this idea of collecting data by data independent acquisition. I think, uh, you know, improvements in hardware and analysis strategies have completely kind of changed the way uh, we think about this. Um, and uh, I would say that a lot of the ways that things changed, like the instrumentation, the hardware, happened to be right around when Jared was a, a graduate student in our lab, and and he was kind of he was the main person that kind of drove our lab into it kind of full on when we we uh, when we decided to kind of take a more targeted approach to data independent acquisition. I think uh, it, it actually is a little complex to kind of wrap your head around sometimes, yeah. and the, the data does have its complexities, and, and it's not quite as easy yet to, to perform these types of analyses and target proteomics or fully even DEA type workflows. But I think uh, I think will kind of introduce this to people and kind of, and also the same, uh, give a little bit of a kind of introduction to how our lab kind of thinks about it, which may not be entirely the way other people have thought about it, but it's, it's not far off. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so we're going to start very simply with how DIA works. So we're going to be giving this lecture, which is really fundamentals, and then after that, we're going to go through doing a DIA analysis that's kind of like that's leveraging the idea, uh, and then you'll hear more from other people in our lab about specifics of how our lab does DIA code and more advanced topics. And then tomorrow, we're going to talk about actually putting together instrument methods for DIA. But for now, we're going to start with really the basic fundamentals. So I think one good way to think about DIA is to see it in the context of kind of more familiar methods. Uh, so on the left here is a kind of framework of data dependent acquisition, uh, and over here is parallel reaction monitoring. Uh, and DIA is kind of in between. So uh, what we people say is the primary really unique thing about DIA in this paper. Just looking at like very simple these lines, what's the main difference? Covers everything. So that's I think um, where a lot of the interest from uh, comes from is the fact that it's comprehensive. Um, people can kind of analyze DIA data in two different ways. There's sort of some people will want to look at DIA data as spectra. So like we're used to looking at DDA data, for example. So in DDA, people will take an MSNS spectrum and try to make an interpretation of that spectrum. Um, with DIA, that's a little bit more challenging. Um, you look at the spectrum, it's extremely busy. Uh, that's a product of having a wide isolation window, and we'll go into that a little bit more. Uh, the way our lab tends to look at DIA data is we take it using sort of a targeted approach, as Mike mentioned, uh, where we're going to look at it more similarly to a PRM or SRM data set. So generally, we can use Skyline to extract chromatograms from DIA data in the same sort of fashion as targeted uh, approaches like PRM, and the quantitation is basically the same. It's just that there are some complications in figuring out where the peptides are, and the data is noisier. Uh, so my goal is to make you guys familiar with some of the reasons for that in this presentation, and some of the specific considerations that you'll need to take when analyzing DIA. Any questions on this? Okay. Uh, so I kind of like to think of DIA as all reaction monitoring. That's a, that's a term that was coined by the Bruce Lab uh, early on because I like it because it makes people immediately think about it in the context of sort of selected reaction monitoring or PRM. Um, here's an example of a DIA approach. Um, one of the early ones we would do in our lab, which would be you simply acquire this uh, cycle of MSMS windows covering 500 and 900 m over z uh, comprehensively. And the key, as mentioned before, is that this cycle of MSMS windows um, covers the entire range. So you're not missing any precursors, and it's a non-stochastic acquisition approach. Uh, generally, I would say the most common platforms uh, for doing DIA uh, is, going to, is going to be the Orbitrap systems and the QTOP systems. Uh, that's not to say you can't do it on the layer ion trap, um, and some of the early manuscripts did, like the Goodless Pacific paper, for example, and actually uh, the really popular Convenable paper from Nature Methods in like 2004, 
top as well. Uh, and also you can do it on an FTICR, like uh, Chad Weisbach had this FT on paper, for example. But the most common platforms you're going to see are Orbitrap and QTOP. And uh, just kind of naturally, because uh, through my entire scientific career I've been working with Orbitrap, I will be kind of speaking in the context of Orbitrap, but I can still answer questions about, about top systems if people have them. And if it's something a little bit over my head, I'm sure you can help. So, um, this is just to show the schematic of the traditional method. So, the first scan is just going to cover, this is representing an MSMS scan. It's measuring 500 to 520 m over Z. So, it's co isolating a ton of precursors together and fragmenting them. Then the next scan, scan number two, uh, just jumps ahead by 20 m over Z. So, these windows are adjacent to each other, isolate and acquire. And the cycle goes down until scan 20, uh, and then goes back to scan 21. So in this range, it's covered everything. Uh, and this entire process, we try to make it take about two seconds uh, on our systems. So the question for you is, is, why is it called data independent acquisition? We're clearly acquiring data. <laughs> why is it data independent? Because you're not based on the target list. So you have to monitor previously. That's right. Yeah, there's no target list. Um, and and to kind of like be a little bit more specific, is there's no list generated from like an MS1 survey scan. So like I think people say DIA uh, in contrast to data dependent acquisition, where in data dependent acquisition, the MSMS scans that you acquire are dependent on the precursors that you would have seen in an MS1 scan event. Whereas in DIA, it's independent of any sort of prior observations in the data. Um, so the scan. The, uh, and people will also say, uh, point out that the sequence of scans is completely independent of what's in your sample, which makes a lot more sense. You acquire prior to each of those cycles one full scan at least to know what your precursors are? Uh, yes, they do. So I think I have in a later slide where we show that. But yes, in each one of the cycles, we'll actually do this full MS1 scan as well. Uh, and we don't use that MS1 data for quantification. So when we're generating pet type detections, it gives us additional confidence in a pet type detection if we also see that precursor information. However, as um, any approach is coming sort of out of our lab, we don't rely on the CD MS1. So we still using our tools have the capability to generate a detection based solely off of MS MS data, even if there is no MS1 signal. Uh, and I'll, I can get into the reasons for that later, but there are times where you expect that you would see a signal on MS MS and not an MS1 uh, due to the limitations of the instrumentation. Any other questions? Um, so here's the try on sort of inside the instrument. This would be what it would look like inside of the Cube Active. Uh, so you've got this filter for 7800, and unlike something like an SRM experiment where you're only letting a very specific ion in, say a 1.7 MZ window or something like that. And here we're letting in 20 m over z, so we have multiple precursors coming in. Each one of those precursors is going to generate fragments and require this mixed fragmentation spectrum. And this is done on a full scan mass analyzer, in this case an Orbitrap. Oh, and there's the MS scans. So that we would frequently acquire MS scans at least once per cycle, sometimes twice per cycle. Uh, so some of the take-homes on this are, of course, the comprehensiveness. So the MS1 acquisition is comprehensive, and so is the MSMS. Uh, zooming in on one particular scan, uh, it's untargeted, so it's not going to form there's no target list. Uh, and one key thing to remember about it being untargeted is that your analytes aren't necessarily going to be isolated in the center of your window. So your, your analyte may be at the very edge of the window even, and it's an important consideration of actually what happens if the thing you're interested in is at the very edge of the window. Uh, furthermore, it's unbiased. So um, any given precursor will be sampled regardless of its intensity, which isn't something that we can necessarily say in data dependent acquisition approaches, where if something doesn't generate a precursor signal, we're not going to sample it, even if it would have been detectable had we done an MSM scan. Uh, and of course, the whole work of, of well, most DIA approaches um, is that they use a wider isolation window than we would 
we do uh, with other approaches. Uh, so now looking at this over time, um, a really important aspect of DI is this consistent sampling. So what I mean by that is this MSMS window is the exact same in this scan as it is here, which means we're able to extract chromatograms from the data. Um, furthermore, these windows, this cycle, in our lab, we make it happen about every two seconds. Um, that's based on the chromatography system. So it's just like if you're thinking about any other targeted method, so SRM or PRM, for example, you need to sample fast enough to get enough points on your chromatographic peak to be able to do good quality. So different people might have different opinions on what that means. We're aiming for about seven points across the peak or more. So when we say, okay, we have a two-second cycle time, that means the minimum width of peak that we would get decent quantification on would be about 15 seconds. And on our HPLC system, <clears throat> it's in, that's a very safe assumption. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so now I'm uh, diving into kind of how Skyline would process this data and, and what happens when you query for a peptide in DIA. So we have this comprehensive data set and uh, the way our lab does is we don't necessarily turn around trying to generate a list of identifications from the data set. We actually say, we have this data set, now I'm going to ask questions of it. So I'm saying, well, is this peptide in the data or not, for example. So if I were to ask the question, uh, this peptide, BLEM, whatever, is it in the data set, the first step is to determine what isolation we really think it's in. So we make an assumption about charge state. Uh, you can, of course, for multiple charge states. In this example, we're going to assume that we, we want to look at the doubly charged precursor for this peptide. So the doubly charged precursor has a mass charge of 790.4, uh, which puts it in this window here, which is between 780 and 800, and we're resumed. Um, now, the key thing, as I mentioned before, is remember, we've sampled this window multiple times. So now what I'm going to show you is kind of a stack of those actual MSMS spectra that contain that peptide. So these axes are, this is fragment ion mass to charge. So we're looking at the single scan of it. This is fragment ion mass to charge, retention time going into the board, and intensity going into the ceiling. So each one of these is an individual MSMS spectrum. Uh, and what I'm highlighting is the Y ion series that Skyline would extract. So when you're thinking about DIA data, hopefully this is a useful visualization. What you're only doing is you have a stack of full scan MSMS spectra, and you're extracting chromatograms from that stack. And your expectation is that any one of these MSMS spectra contains fragments from multiple analytes. In fact, this is a very uh, ideal case where the analyte we're interested in is the most intense in the spectrum. But a lot of times, the analyte you're interested in might only be one one hundredth of it, or one one thousandth even. Uh, and that's a very important thing to consider. Think about how that would impact your quant based on the system you're working with. Uh, if you're working with, say, an orbit trap system, you're putting about a million ions into the orbit trap, and it's going to require an MSMS scan. So you've got a million ions, and let's say you're trying to measure one thing, and it's one one hundredth of the spectrum. So you have not as many ions for that as if it was the most intense thing there. So that's where, when you think about sensitivity trade-offs in PIA or something like PRM, that's where a lot of that comes in. Any questions? Okay, so DIA data analysis and styling, it actually looks pretty similar to uh, SRM approaches, which is pretty cool, I think. So you start off by building your list of target peptides. By now, you guys are pretty familiar with this view. Um, this list can, uh, in the tutorial I'm going to present later today, and this will come from a set of identifications of peptides that you know we've seen before from DDA data. Um, but with our more advanced approaches, you would be detecting these peptides directly from DIA data, and that's what Brian Searle is going to talk about later today. But the basic concept, the fundamental concept, is you have a set of peptides that you're hoping to query the data for, you have made an assumption about what their precursor and or is, and, you've also, and you also know what their fragment ion mass to charges are. So this is what the extracted data would look like in Skyline. Um, we have both the MS2 and the MS1 data. Uh, one thing you can notice immediately from the MS1 is, because the MS1 data is less selective, we tend to usually see more peaks in the MS1 data. Of course, only one of them is the correct one, but the MS2 data is more selective. So we expect that we would see less sort of 
it's not really interference, but less, uh, less maybe confounding peaks that would make it difficult to figure out which is the right one. Uh, so zooming in on this peak, uh, the next thing you have to do is select the peak boundaries, just like for anything else. Um, one thing about this particular peptide is there's actually this difference in shape between the MS1 and the MS2 data. Uh, does anybody know why that would be? Sample seven times. Sample seven times. Well, yeah, in this case, the, so you see it's different in peak sampling rates. So it's actually the, the difference in shape here is due to a sampling issue. I think there's, there's probably adequate sampling in both, in both of these cases um, for this particular one because this peak is rather on the wider side. Um, I don't know what that is. The difference times is the average of the difference times. The difference actually acquisition, but so the MSP is just not. No, it's actually the MS1 is still acquired, like, you know, it's every, about every two seconds. So we're not doing any signal averaging in here. We're not doing any averaging of scans in this particular case. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. They're acquired. They are acquired at slightly different times, yes. I don't know. It's not, I, don't, I don't think it's because they're acquired at different times. I actually think my hypothesis is, so I don't know like, the necessarily correct answer, but generally, what I see, I expect to see differences a lot of times between the shape of the MS1 and the MS2 because they're interfered with differentially. So you could have a co-leading peptide, right, that has a very similar mass to charge to the MS1, but the signal's resolved on the MS2 level just because you have more selectivity. So the, the simplest case would be if you have an analyte that is an MOZ within, say, that's not resolved in MS1, but in MS2, it's got a completely different sequence. So you have two completely different peptides with very similar precursor MOZ, and you can have these sorts of things where you have like a shoulder or a slightly different MS1 shape. So the interferences that you see in MS1 don't necessarily carry over to MS2 and vice versa. So when you start to say we have differences in the quant in the quant in the sensitivity of PIA versus the sensitivity of MS1, typically one big reason for that is the differences in the signal. So in MS1, we generally will see more cases of chemical noise interference, so it's interference from other analytes in the mixture versus MS2. And this is all just very classical mass spectrometry. These concepts of thin mass spectrometry having better selectivity than MS1. Um, so when this stuff first came out, it was people doing stuff on like triple quads where the selectivity was obviously higher because you're using this really narrow precursor isolation window. The reason DIA has been something that we can do now is because we're able to get to under 20 MZ windows, and I think that's about the widest we can do without having some serious sensitivity trade-offs. As the window gets narrower and narrower, selectivity gets higher and higher, and the sensitivity of DIA gets better and better because there's less chemical noise interference. That's a concept I'll go over multiple times. So if people don't understand it, you'll hear about it again. I wonder whether your isolation window is always the same range when you do seven times. Is there any overlap, or how is that done? Yeah, so in the, in the methods I'm talking about, so far it's exactly the same. In the traditional methods, that's how it's done. Our lab actually does this overlapping windows approach, um, where in in this particular scan is 20 scans, right? So we call that one cycle. And then cycle two is the next one scans. What we'll do is every other cycle will offset the windows by half the window width. And when we do that, it allows us to actually do multiplex the data on a little 10 MZ window instead of 20 MZ. Yeah, there's a lot of fancy tricks to play to improve selectivity. So, so you have to pull yeah. that's good. Uh, affects the MS2, and we have the MS2 that's polyvalent in the case. Why? Is it okay? Uh, not, not necessarily. It's a deep peptide that's in but their signal can be resolved by MS2. Right? So imagine having two peptides um, that have a completely different sequence, and the same sequence, so they share none of their fragment on mass of charges, but they co -allude. Um Those will still be resolved. So that's not the problem. The problem is when they co -allude, and they share a fragment ion mass to charge. So when you think about that, think about like a triptych digest, right? So when you look at DIA data, 
the Y1 ion is always worthless. Okay, because the Y1 ion is always going to have a lysine or an RG. So if any peptide that gets isolated in that 20Z window is going to have that same Y1. There's only two options, right? If you have, well, if you're in perfect perfect digest. There's only two options, basically. And so that's going to be heavily interfered with fragment. Finally, as you get further and further into the fragment ion series, the individual fragment ions are more and more selected. But I mean, one way to think about it is, in a sense, you add an interference in one or two fragment ions, you've got a bunch of others to choose from, right? In MS1, you don't have much recourse if you have sort of interference uh, in there. Okay. Good. Um, so this is where people start to say DIA is like SRM on all because in an SRM or PRM approach, you are requiring these consistent uh, chromatographic measurements, but it's only on a set of peptide precursors that you predetermined. Uh, whereas on DIA, we've acquired this comprehensive stuff, and so we can, in theory, turn around and extract it on any peptide we want. But it doesn't mean it's going to be detected, but we can make that query. And I think that's an important distinction. So uh, thinking about sort of inside the instrument, what's going on. Um, Thinking about the comparison to SRM, SRM may have a much narrower isolation window, uh, and it's going to be targeted rather than untargeted, as in DIA. Uh, and then the mass analysis. So if it's SRM, it's using a mass filter. Uh, if it's DIA, it's a full scan. Uh, and then in SRM, it's low resolution MSMS, uh, whereas in most DIA approaches, it's high res accurate mass, mass analyzer. Um, so inside of the triple quad, you're sort of measuring one of these transitions at a time. Uh, and then it just repeats that process throughout the chromatogram. Uh, whereas in DIA, we're doing these full-scan analyses. And then doing a targeted extraction. So we have this full-spectrum information, but when Skyline displays the chromatograms, it's only displaying the subset of that spectrum that, that you're interested in. And then it goes through the whole process. Uh, but then, once you have this chromatographic data, the algorithms for, for quantification are the same. Like, Skyline's not doing anything particularly different. It's still doing the same background subtraction and all of that for DIA. Okay, so thinking about some of the advantages, just in the context of doing an experiment, DIA is a lot easier. Um, the, data, the key point is the data acquisition is very early in the process for DIA. Can anybody maybe think about like why that's helpful? Has anybody done like a major SRM assay development project? You have to you have to acquire. You first have to figure out what peptides you can measure. So you might look to DDA data. You might do a bunch of measurements on your particular protein standards to figure out what peptides. And then you have to go through this iterative refinement of the SRM method. You have to then refine your transitions. Say, oh, is this the right target state for this peptide, or do I want this different one? And then you've developed this whole SRM assay, and you realize, oh, man, I wonder if this other protein is in the data. And then you have to go back and add that other protein, not to mention that all of the data you acquired on your, in my mind, precious samples, you don't have any information on that protein. So these sorts of considerations are where people start to get interested in DIA and maybe become okay with some of the quantitative trade-offs that you make with DIA data instead of SRMs. But even in our, I mean, in our lab, what's really neat is people can hand us a sample and we can just acquire the data. And then if they ask, what about this other protein? It's like, well, we'll go query for it. Um, oh, shoot, this transition is interfered, so I can switch to another transition. Those are the sorts of benefits that you get um, with this comprehensive acquisition that are more practical benefits, I think. Um, but the basic idea is you're getting a complete snapshot of your sample rather than just a really narrow snapshot of stuff you're interested in. Um, there's still uh, a lot of reasons you would want to do SRM. It's going to be more sensitive, and it's a cheaper instrument. It might be a more robust assay. Uh, and certainly, if you want to measure one amyloid over and over with high quality and, and, and a lot of them, then SRM is probably what you want to be doing. Um, so, uh, comparing DIA to SRM and PRM, this table I think kind of dri drives it home. Uh, I'll just leave it in the slides for you guys to use as a reference since I've already gone over all these concepts. Um, so then, comparing DIA to DDA, so technically DDA is acquiring comprehensive data. It's just the MS1 is comprehensive, not the MS2. 
um, which is still useful, but the problem is we can't just take an MS1 spectrum, look at the precursors, and make a good identification without the help of MSMS data. So, for example, um, I just pulled out one particular mass I saw and looked at it with a 10 ppm tolerance from the MS1 data, and we have all of these sequences that could potentially map to this, the this same theoretical mass to charge. So you say, well, which one of these is it? I don't know. Usually in DDA, you require an MSMS and do some sort of scoring, like, for example, export, and now it's obvious what the correct one is. So we needed that additional selectivity from the MSMS to make an ID, but we don't have MSMS on everything, so we ID a subset. Um, DIA, we have the combination of both. We have selective and comprehensive MS2. Um, so, anyway, we talked about the DIA and we kind of talked about, but why do, we, why do we need it? <laughs> I think I'm more confident now that we need it. In fact, I think we definitely do. Um, but when I was kind of addressed to it, uh, you know, it's, you're less confident in what you're doing. <laughs> I have questions, but why do we need it? Um, because a lot of people say, well, we already can do DDA. I can make these samples, I can generate a big list of identifications. But why is it necessary? Um, you can do database searches, uh, you can then do spectral counting and almost one qualification. Uh, why do we need it? And in my mind, it's the ability to not have any missing data. So you can query the data and make at least say, listen, is this peptide there or not? It's not just a question of making an identification or not. It's just being able to even look for it. Because in DDI, you can't necessarily do that all the time. All right, so when I was a grad student, I was supposed to figure out why, why do we age? <laughs> Uh, I didn't end up actually figuring it out. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was supposed to take these yeast samples uh, with interesting mutations. In this case, it was going to be wild type yeast versus ones with this target of rapamycin knockout. So, target of right rapamycin was kind of this, uh, this interesting signaling protein that, uh, that, that if you knock it down, you know, mice live longer, people might live longer, that sort of thing. And it's this classic study design of I want to sort of use the mechanism of Torlan. Uh, I didn't even get to the stage of growing yeast. I don't know how to grow yeast. It turns out when you're in an instrument lab, you end up doing instrument stuff, even if you're studying <laughs> crazy biology. Um, but you can imagine that I would have taken the stack of wild type yeast and the stack of Torlan. I would have grown up and I would acquire DDA data on it. And I would get the stack of peptide spectrum matches. Some of them are blue, uh, some of them are red, uh, depending on if they came from wild type or tor. And the classical sort of protein profiling approach by DDA. We then take those PSMs and then map them to the MS1 data uh, and then generate quantifications from that MS1. So this is like MS1 profiling is, I think, how, how or MS1 filtering is how Brendan presents this. Um, so then I'm trying to figure out why we age. Uh, and I have these, uh, these PSMs. Uh, so I've, I've detected, hopefully, or identified a, a subset of these proteins. Uh, and I've generated this list with quantification that hopefully I have across every sample. But then what will definitely happen is my PI will come to me and say, well, what about life in one? <laughs> and uh, I can't tell them anything. Um, and it, because I never even made an MSMS sample of it. So this is the thing. It's like I never even sampled it. So I can't tell you if the reason I can't see it is because it was never sampled or because it's not there in the sample or because it's not really detectable at all. At least with DIA, I eliminate that it wasn't sampled. I can say I at least looked for it. So I can tell my PI I at least tried. Right? Um, so then it begs the question, well, what does DDA miss? Um, this is something, like, these numbers change all the time. So this is just to give people a general idea. Um, this is an analysis we did on a QEXACT and HF uh, over about 60 minutes. And we found that roughly 34% of MS, MS features that we found uh, were never sampled, um, and then of that, a very small subset was identified. Um, now, to put this in perspective, this is never a feature identified, but typically I think people would have uh, more identifications than this. So certainly as DDA uh, improves, uh, people are going to be identifying more and more features. But even if you're measuring and identifying every single one of one feature, I would argue that there's still more in the data, because I can show examples of signal that we see in MSMS that we don't see in MS1. Uh, and then, of course, yeah, I don't know where within one falls in here. Uh, and as we sample deeper and deeper, uh, your ability to identify using DDA-based approaches becomes worse and worse as precursor intensity gets reduced. Okay, 
So the fact is home, um, let's say I was interested in finding the book Harry Potter in the library, which uh, <laughs> would be. Uh, so in DDA, you're sort of sampling a bunch of books from the library, so this would be similar to acquiring some of SMS spectra. Uh, and then you're generating a list of identifications. Like, one, thing that, one thing that people really shouldn't do with DDA is take this list of identifications and walk out of the library and say Harry Potter is not there. Right, that's the thing that people can do, is if you generate this list of IDs, you have to be very careful to say, well, I didn't identify it, that doesn't mean it's not there. Um, so identification is not a proxy for detection. Um, but a DIA practitioner would go into the library and say, well, I know where Harry Potter is because I know it starts with age, I know exactly where it should be. That's similar to DIA, we know the coordinates of the peptide roughly because we know the precursor ions and we know the fragment ions, so we know how to search selectively for that signal uh, and try to find the book directly. Uh, so we can look directly for the, the book and make a conclusion. Uh, so this general concept is uh, the difference between sort of a spectrum-centric analysis, I think, versus a peptide-centric analysis. Uh, so this is uh, stuff that's kind of detailed in the manuscripts by uh, Sonia Ting. Uh, and actually, you know, it was like the McCoss lab and the Abramson lab. I, I think that's sort of the, the main people pushing this line of thinking. So uh, spectrum-centric analysis is sort of the classical DDA approach where you have a stack of MSMS spectra uh, and you have a protein sequence database. And for each one of those MSMS spectrum, your goal is to interpret it and generate an identification. Um, in DIA, it's different, and in peptide-centric analysis, it's different. Rather than starting with a stack spectrum and saying, I want to identify each one, we're going to take a stack of peptides of interest, we're going to extract the chromatograms for that peptide of interest, so this is retention time versus the uh, intensity for each of the fragment ions, and then we're going to say, okay, across retention time, where in my data is the best evidence for this particular peptide? So, What's the highest score? Where do we see the best evidence? And from that, return statistics on our confidence in the detection. Any questions on that? Does that make sense to people? It's kind of a complicated idea. Subtle, I think. No? Alright. Uh, so here's an example of us using... Uh, this is a comparison between data-dependent acquisition and DIA for detections. Uh, so this is some early work from Sonia's pecan algorithm. Uh, we're, what we're doing here is trying to get a sense for how many peptides can we identify with DDA versus with DIA. Uh, so in this particular data set, this is um, multiple instrument generations ago. I think this is a Q-exactive uh, classic. Um, so this is looking at a hemolysate, acquiring DDA data, searching for just these 8,000 um, GST fusion proteins. So it's not searching for a full sequence database. The reason we're not searching the full sequence database is we can actually sit around and synthesize and enrich for all of these fusion proteins that's in the library that we had. So we can turn around and validate these detections. Um, so what we found is if we do DDA on 500 and 900 MORZ, and we compare it to this DIA approach with 500 and 900 MOR Z. So 500 and 900 is kind of a narrower range to cover. Uh, the reason we do 500 and 900 is with DIA you get better quantification if you cover a narrower range. So it's a trade-off between quantitative accuracy and um, breadth of peptide detections. But anyway, so you're looking at the number of peptides you can detect, and with DDA, we're outpacing DIA. So this is uh, the traditional DIA approach that I showed using 2020 MZ windows. Um, however, the next experiment we tried is to say, we're going to shoot that same sample twice. So we're going to do two LCMSMS runs, and we're going to do gas phase fractionation. So we're going to do DDA on just limited to 500 to 700 MZ, and then we're going to do it on 700 to 900. Similarly with DIA, we're going to go from 500 to 700 MZ for the first injection and then 700, 900 for the second. And all of a sudden, we're able to identify a lot more peptides with DIA. Does anybody, uh, can anybody take a guess for why? Like, what's the key difference in the methods that would cause us to get more detections? No. Yeah, narrow windows, right? Because it's less complex spectra. That's the main thing we're trying to overcome is the spectrum complexity with DIA. 
So it's saying, okay, well, if I can do two injections per sample, I might be able to measure more things. Um, and then if you go all the way up to four injections per sample, now we're starting to get some impressive numbers. Brian's going to talk about sort of uh, more like modern numbers. I like can still some of this number, which is with HeLa. We're getting on the order of 80,000 peptides when we do these sorts of experiments. Um, so we can get some, some pretty impressive detection numbers, and hopefully we can turn around and get good quant on a lot of those. Um, so, so how far does this go? Basically, how, how if I've got my isolation width at 10, how much do I improve by going to 8 to 6 or 4 M over Z isolation windows? And basically, uh, what this is showing is that you can continue to see improvements in your ability to detect peptides all the way down to at least a 2 M over Z isolation window. We didn't try to go lower than that. We didn't try to go to 1 or anything because then we start to have concerns about sensitivity with the quadruple not being able to isolate as efficiently. Um, but what this shows is that we need to try to get those windows as narrow as possible. Any questions on that? That's right. Yeah. So it's it all. So I'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow when I'm doing a method design. But I can give you the basic idea. You already know what MZ range you want to cover, roughly. So let's just take advantage of you decided. You want to cover 500 and 900. You've also said, I need to sample every two seconds, right? Because of your chromatography. That's not going to change. So now, if you say you have 20 M over Z windows, you're like, okay, that's 20 windows per cycle. So that's the amount of time I can spend. You need to down to 10. You know it's going to take twice as long, so it's 2x injections. It's just, you know, the instrument scan rate is about 10 hertz, so you have 20 windows per cycle that you can do. So you the window with multiply it by that. Okay, so I've talked kind of about uh, making detections in DID data that you might not be able to see in the MS1. Uh, and this is just a slide of examples. So this is one particular protein where it just happened to have a lot of uh, detections that we're, we're only seeing in the DIA data and not seeing in the DDA data. This is DIA data acquired with, I think this is 5 MR Z wide uh, isolation windows. So each one of these panes is a different peptide. Uh, and on the top is the MS1 signal that's tracking this line, And now on the bottom is the MS2 signal. Uh, so one thing that's in common between all of these peptides is that the MS1 signal happens to be very low. Similarly, the MS2 signal, I mean, it's not always clean. These are, we're thinking in the dirt. You know, a lot of peptides are going to have good MS2 and MS1. But this is obviously an example that's designed to be a little bit more striking. Um, you know, particularly for this peptide, you see almost no MS1. This one, you see MS1, but with a lot of interference. So this is where, this is sort of the actual example of what I was talking about before, where the better selectivity of DIA gives you this still kind of cleaner signal. Uh, and in DIA, you might not, you might either not sample this MS1 precursor or there's enough interference that it shifts the mass outside of whatever your search tolerance is. So if it pushes it outside of, say, a 10 ppm tolerance, you might not even search for it by DDA. Does that make sense to people? Uh, this is another example. So this is uh, a particular peptide in a spiking experiment where we were finding that our sensitivity by DIA was much better than by MS1. Uh, and so it's pretty clear when you look at the signal at 96 pentamol, we already have interference in the MS1, but none in the MS2. And then once you get down to 4 pentamol spike into the, into the matrix, it's very clear that you almost see no specific signal for your peptide in MS1, but you still have a decent signal for your MS2. Uh, and then backing out a little bit to the results from the entire experiment, this is showing on aggregate. Uh, in this case, we spiked in uh, roughly 30 bovine peptides into the yeast background around the sonic cube method. So it's just a spiking curve experiment going from 96 pentamol down to 100 animal. Uh, and we're asking what was the lower limit of quantitation for all those peptides. So by MS1, uh, oh, and the, met sorry, the methods we used was this 500 to 920MZ DIA. Uh, we also did this overlapping window approach, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, which is our kind of way of tricking it and getting down to better selectivity. Uh, and then this 10 MRZ approach where we're doing two injections 
right? So two injections both times you win those. And what we wanted to know was how does our sensitivity improve for each of these? So here's the, uh, the sensitivity in the MS1 scans. So remember, I've interlaced MS1 scans with the MS2s. So this is if you do quantification based on just the MS1 signal. Uh, the two 20MZ methods match, and then the, the 10MZ is a little bit better sensitivity because it's measuring just 500 to 700, or it's measuring just a 200MZ range in each MS scan instead of the full wider range. And then comparing that to the, uh, the average uh, lower level of quantification by DIA. So just looking at this particular um, little column here, you can see here's with 20MZ wide windows, we have slightly better sensitivity than by MS1 port. Uh, but once you drop down to using these overlapping windows approach or 10MZ, we're now you know, clearly outpacing MS1 based port in terms of sensitivity. Uh, these different columns are if you're using the top five most intense transitions for quantification, or if you're using the top three most inputs, uh, and then the top seven. So generally, I use the top five or the top three when I do quantification. Uh, okay, so now that I've got everybody getting the cool aid, the promise of DIA is you acquire this great molecular image or digital archive of the sample. You mine it over and over again. You don't need to deal with sort of retention time scheduling or any of these challenges for targeted methods. You can make direct queries of your data and get p-values for your peptides of interest and you have better quantification than DDA. Uh, but what are the challenges, right? So, uh, one of the challenges is illustrated here. Um, you guys have seen, you know, enough skyline plots at this point. Can anybody take a guess of what's happening in this plot? This is the MSMS signal uh, extracted for this peptide here. Yeah. Yeah, you guys are on the right track. So, let's, so why am I seeing a signal for both of these? I wouldn't see that in PRM. What's that? Oxidation? Yeah. So there's a methylamine oxidation event happening. But normally, you know, in most targeting approaches, you're going to resolve these because they're not going to be co isolated with each other. But with DIA, they're going to be co isolated. So in this case, it's using a 10 Z isolation window. And the, uh, the thymine oxidation is 16, and then divided by 3 is 5.3, I think. Yeah, five, oh, wow, that's pretty good for this early in the morning. So 5.3 M over Z squared. Um, and so they're going to be co-isolated in this particular window. So even though we told Skyline, okay, extract the Y ion series from this peptide and the B ions, I guess, uh, you get this signal, but you also get this confounding signal where you're not quite sure. Um, so it's not as bad as it looks. At least the retention time resolved. Uh, this is an example of where MS1 data could help. So if we had the MS1 signal, we might see, oh, there's only MS1 signal for this one and not for the uh, oxidized one. Uh, so that can also help us gain confidence. But this is a good example of some of the challenges that we might see by DIA. And you can imagine this being a challenge for an algorithmic approach that's trying to automatically pick peaks in DIA. When I first started doing DIA, I would manually pick every single peak. Uh, which the whole comprehensiveness thing, it all of a sudden sounds terrible because it means there's like 10,000 peaks to pick. Um, but now we have these automated approaches uh, that um, now are smart enough to sort of resolve these kinds of issues. But I think Brian will talk about that more. So, so I think my data will think that speed of somehow know that these two are the same. Yeah, it would, it would um, like the con is the one that we've been using in our lives, and what the con will do is it'll say, this one is the best peak for this oxidized, for, for the peptide you queried for. So it would, for example, notice like, well, you know, maybe there's a little bit less transitions that match here. Like obviously anything in the YN series, that's the terminal to the methionine, wait, and terminal, yes, and terminal to the methionine, um, would be a differential transition. Uh, it would also, if the MS1 data is there, like if there's an MS1 signal here, this will increase its confidence in this particular peptide. Yeah, but the narrower your windows are, the less of these issues you have, and the more confident you'll be in any given detection. Any other questions? I have a general question. Yeah. Like, you know, you were saying that you have to do the MS1 and the Yeah. 
No, I, I trust people's ability to do that. Like, I, I mean, I can just say, let's just assume that it does that perfectly. So it takes some, it takes some identification and it, and it successfully maps it across all samples. You still can't ask the general question of, is this peptide in my sample or not? You can't go to where you would expect the peptide to be and say, I have an MSMS sampling of the peptide. Right? So there's still going to be missing holes in your data where you never would have acquired the, data, the, the stuff to see it. Now, it is a little bit, what's the right term for it? It's kind of nitpicking because in reality, your MSMS sampling is tied to peptide detectability. So it's not a terrible assumption to say, well, if I didn't identify it all by DDA, it's probably this lower, lower um, concentration, and that's probably why I didn't generate an identification. So none of these approaches are like invalid or anything like that. It's just it's just that I have to like exaggerate the differences to get it across to you guys. Yeah. Are there any cases where you find MS one spectrum are superior? Oh yeah. Thanks. Oh yeah. Thanks for asking that. Yes, absolutely. Um, so even in this, uh, you know, even in that. This plot of like 30 peptides, if I split this out by peptides, you would find cases where for certain peptides, the MS1 is going to give you better quant than the MS2. Um, theoretically, the cases where you expect that to happen are um, if your sample is not as complex, the MS1, if the complexity becomes less and less in your sample, MS1 is going to become better and better than MS2. Um, so if I had a sample with a single peptide in it, I would definitely be doing MS1 quant, not MS2. I wouldn't bother to fragment that peptide and split its signal up into multiple peaks and potentially lose ions in the process. So, MS, the, the DIA MS2 quantification you would expect to be better than MS1 on average if the sample is complex enough that you have interference in the MS1 frequently. So, that's where DIA starts to outpace the MS1 is because of the removal of chemical noise interference, the greater selectivity. But if your yeah, but if your sample is not that complex, then you don't need the selectivity. And in that case, MS1 is theoretically the better way to go. Um, and then, yeah, peak picking is sort of challenging. So I, I discussed this before a little bit. Um, but I, mean, I showed you guys some ideal cases, but frequently, You'll look at a DIA data set and you'll see something like this and you'll say, wow, I have no idea where the peak is. And this actually generated an, an ID and there's actually a good signal there. Um, so if you look at the MSMS, there's quite a few uh, fragment ions that are matching. Uh, the MS1 in this case isn't great. It has some interference. But there is a signal there. It's just extremely challenging to pick peaks. So I think DIA has become more and more popular recently because people are working on how clever ways to, to fix this peak picking problem. Uh, and, and now we're starting to, to benefit from it. Uh, so one of those new algorithms is pecan, um, but also there's, I mean, I don't even need to list the algorithms, there's a ton of them. Uh, automated peak integration, so you guys kind of were, were talking about during the Sky Jam earlier today, there were questions about like the automated boundary setting and how that affects the background. But for DIA, it's even stressing those algorithms more because there's generally more interferences. So this is an example. Um, I, I think Skyland is better now at this than it used to. This is sort of an old slide, but you would see cases like this where the automated uh, thing would get tripped up by a little shoulder and integrate incorrectly, or you would include a noisy transition, and for some reason it would try to in include that in the quant. So just generally, as, because the signal is noisier, it's just stressing all these algorithms a lot more. So these are sorts of the challenges that we had to work around uh, to automatically analyze DIA data. Uh, and then there's this concept of uh, sort of image quality, which is I can tell you that DIA data is comprehensive, but it could be comprehensively bad. <laughs> like, you could argue, like, well, we're acquiring this crappy data with 20 MZ windows, so good, it's comprehensive, but it's, comp it's like it looks like this. You can't really see much from it. Um, I think that's a, a valid argument if you're acquiring, like, 30 MZ windows on a linear ion trap or something. But I think that with... 20 MZ, 26 MZ maybe, or or less isolation window width, you start to make the argument that the comprehensiveness is worth the degradation in quality. Uh, so to, to wrap this all up, um, 
you think about DNA versus Western MPRM versus um, DDA, uh, you think of it like this. So SRM or PRM, you're getting these really high quality measurements on a predetermined subset of your sample or your image. Uh, DDA, we're doing this stochastic sampling, and we're still getting a really good picture on aggregate. Um, and covering a lot of the peptides, but there might be some that we miss. Uh, GIA, we're kind of zooming in on this particular subsection of the image, but acquiring a, a comprehensive measurements on it. Um, <laughs> I forgot about this slide. I think I removed this before, but okay. Um, like DDA on future instruments, this is kind of tongue in cheek, but as they scan faster and faster, <laughs> Even if you don't agree with DIA, you're going to accidentally start doing it eventually because you're just going to cover everything. <laughs> so um, at some point, I think DIA will be a no-brainer. Uh, it just depends on how, how narrow those isolation window widths need to get uh, to have the quality necessary. Um, any questions on that? Okay, so I'll just quickly dive into what our lab's actual in-practice DIA workflow looks like. Um, this was all talking about fundamental stuff, which can be a little nebulous, but generally if someone says, Jared, uh, we want you to do DIA analysis on plasma. Uh, the first thing I'll do is I want to generate uh, what we call a chromatogram library. So I will take a pool of plasma from a bunch of individuals, and I'm just going to try to generate a ton of detections from that pool to, to build a library. So uh, in order to do that, I do 12 injections. So we were talking about doing two MZ isolation windows. I'll do two MZ isolation windows and use 12 injections to measure that sample. So here's, for example, the first run is only covering 400 to 450 MOZ, uh, and I do 25 two MZ MSMS scans. So that takes about 25, two and a half seconds to run through. Uh, and from that, you have selectivity that's close to PRM, but you have everything in these 12 LCMS MS runs. So it's kind of, it's kind of a day of instrument time. From that, we use PECAN to generate uh, peptide detections. And from that, that's using this sort of approach, that's where we can touch like 80,000 peptide detections in HeLa. I think it's about like six to 7,000 proteins. Uh, so, can I hear a question? No? Okay. Uh, so, we would use PECAN to generate those detections. Um, from that chromatogram library, skipping past all this stuff, from that chromatogram library, we would then take our actual sample cohort and do single shot DIA analysis on each of those. So I'm not going to spend 12 injections on every sample. I do 12 injections on the pool, and then when I want to analyze the actual samples, I do these single injection runs with these 20 MC wide windows on each individual sample and use the detections from this library to help aid in making detections in the actual single shot runs. So the tool that does that, that maps from the chromatogram library to these, it's called Encyclopedia, uh, which Brian will talk about um, in his lecture a little later today. Uh, when we ran this on plasma on effusion in our library, we got 495 uh, proteins. That's only counting proteins that have at least one proteotypic peptide for them, so one that uniquely maps to that protein. Um, when we did it actually recently on Lumos, we pushed up to, I think it was like mouse plasma, and we got 650. Um, oh, shoot, I guess I don't have the other slides on that. Well, it is about break time anyway, so I think I'll end it there, and we'll take a five minute break, and then we'll do the uh, DIA tutorial, and I'll just stand here and take any questions if people have them.